بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أب القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس صل على محمد وآل محمد Another salawat for the love of the Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam. A third salawat for the love of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. We live in an era where being religious and following a religious system is not the norm. Meaning that if you are considering yourself a religious person and you want to live a religious lifestyle, you will find yourself amongst the minority. Even if your religion is a vast religion. And here we're not speaking only about the religion of Islam, we're speaking about all religions. Today, a religious Christian person will find themselves a minority in this society. A religious Jewish person, a religious Muslim person, and anyone who wants to consider themselves religious will consider themselves a minority. Because of the challenges that anyone who wants to hold on to religion are facing in this society. And there is a growing population, a group of people who say that they don't want to have anything to do with any religion and any religious establishment. And this population of atheists, or the ones that consider themselves the unaffiliated with any religion, it's a growing population and a growing movement. In the past seven years, just in the past seven years, the population of atheists, or ones who consider themselves unaffiliated with any religion, has grown from 16% to 23% in the United States of America. This population has grown, and we see that anyone who considers themselves religious or wants to be a part of a religion, finds challenges. 
and religious churches, religious establishments are constantly losing members. Just a few weeks ago, the Pope, he came to the United States of America and he had to make so many concessions. He had to give up on his belief system so that people remain Catholic, so that people stay worshiping according to the Catholic establishment. And other churches are also losing in numbers and participants. And we see statistics show that the religion of Islam, although the number is growing day after day and year after year in population, but we see that the ones who are actually religious Muslims, they are decreasing. Islam is growing by number. Islam is growing by quantity but it's not growing by quality. And we see that people are leaving religions for two main reasons. The first reason is that they say, we have seen so many bad things from people that claim to be religious. I see this person, he did this. This Catholic priest, he did this. He was abusing the children, so I'm not going to join the Catholic Church. This one, this sheikh here, he said this to me the other day, and I'm not going to become a Muslim anymore. And people bring excuses because of actions of individuals. And this is, although it sounds funny, but this is very common. You ask people, why don't you go to the church? Why don't you go to the masjid? Why aren't you a part of a religion? Yes, because this and this. They point out stories of individuals. Now, this doesn't make sense. Let me say, I don't believe in the government because one or two of the politicians, they're corrupt, so therefore I don't believe in the whole system of the government. This doesn't make sense, but we see that people continue to do this. And also, some people blame, and they say, look at religions. You see people who claim to be religious, look at the fighting, the wars, the bloodshed, and inshallah in the upcoming nights I'm going to be talking about Sharia law and religious extremism. And we will speak about this issue. But many people they point out to this issue, they say religious people, look at them, all they're doing is fighting, I don't want to be a part of this religious system. It's as if it's only the religious people that are fighting. It's as if no one else is fighting with one another. It's only the ones who claim to be religious. And then on the other hand, you find the media, the environment, the public atmosphere, the universities, they are preaching against any established religion. Not only Islam. Anyone who considers themselves religious, they will find difficulties and challenges attending a university here in the United States and in the West. I've heard from people, and I've seen this. I've heard, I heard from a friend, he was telling me that he was in a class. As soon as he went in the class, the professor, he told the first day of the class, the professor, he asked the students, who of you believes in God? So the ones that believed in God, they raised their hands. Then he told them, why do you believe in God? And he began to refute their arguments, one after the other. This is the first day of class. Starting off the class by teaching people to turn against God and turn against any religious establishment. And the problem is that this is, this is, the, first, this is the first argument. The first argument is that people say, I don't want religion. And the second, they say that you see the problems that religion is causing. And then they come and they say, religion is irrelevant. Religion today, we don't need to have religion. We live in a time where religion is not necessary anymore. People used to believe, people used to pray at a time where they wanted their crops to grow. When they saw someone who was sick, they don't know what kind of a disease this person has. This person is just dying day after the, another. They don't know what's wrong with this person, so they pray. Now we have technology, we have medicine, we have sent people to space, 
we have all of this advancement in technology and in science and in medicine. There's no need for God. There's no need for religion. Now, how do we answer this? My dear brothers and sisters, the religion of Islam is a very logical religion. And everything has to make sense in the religion of Islam. If you hear someone sitting on the mumbar and saying something that does not make sense, go and question that person. Go and tell that person, bring me the proof. This is the beauty of the religion of Islam and spe specifically the Shia school of thought. We are following the proof. We follow the hujjah. If someone does not convince you, does not bring you hujjah, then you don't need, you have to go and ask for a hujjah because on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to tell you, why did you take that path? I need to answer. Why? For example, why am I following Ali ibn Abi Talib? I need to know. I need to know the proof of the imamah so that I can answer. So we have to bring an answer, a logical answer, because this religion is a very logical religion. And when someone comes and brings an argument against your religion, against your foundations, against your belief system, you have to be able to answer. How many of us are remain quiet? How many of us are not able to answer when someone comes and, and questions my faith and criticizes my belief system? The problem is not with my belief system. The problem is with me when I'm not able to answer. Because the Prophet, he came and he justified. The Quran justified. We have the hujjah, we have the proof. So this is the first argument. Some people, they say, we don't see that religion is relevant. Religion is not necessary. We don't need religion. Right now I have money. If anything happens to me, I go to the doctor. The doctor is able to cure me. We have advanced in science and in technology. And here, this is where you see the human being, how arrogant this human being can become. This human being who is, who is hurt very easily. One bacteria, one bacteria could kill a person. One small bacteria that you can't even see. But then you see the same human being as soon as he has a few dollars in his bank account, he's driving a nice car, this person becomes so arrogant that he becomes arrogant even with his own creator, even with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. الَّذِي جَمَعَ مَالًا وَعَدَّدَهُ يَحْسَبُ أَنَّ مَالَهُ أَخْلَدَهُ He thinks that his wealth is going to make him live for eternity. He thinks everyone else will die, but he will not die. This is the human being. There's a hadith. It says that, why are you so ignorant, arrogant, oh human? Your start was from a clot of semen, and your end is going to be a jifa. You're going to be, you're going to rot. And in between, you're carrying najasat with you. You're carrying filth with you. And then you come and you consider yourself so arrogant. You consider yourself so powerful. First of all, the knowledge, the science, the knowledge that we have, is that enough to prove that we don't need God anymore? First of all, you ask any scholar, you ask any scientist, because the religion of Islam doesn't have a problem with science like you see other religions. There is no contradiction between education and science and the religion of Islam. There should be no contradiction because Allah is the creator and he created that system that the scientists are using. So there is no problem. You find in other religions they have grudges and they have a problem with science. The religion of Islam doesn't. But today you go and you ask any scholar, any scientist, they'll tell you that what we do not know is much more than what we do know. And this is a proven fact. There is more that we do not know in this life than what we do know. So is this enough proof to come and say, I don't worship God anymore because I have a, a, a little portion of knowledge in my head? Is that enough? And second, for the ones who say religion is not relevant anymore. 
has the technology that we have built, the medicine that we have reached, has it stopped people from dying? Has the technology helped people? Or have we seen that it is causing more bloodshed? Because before, people used to fight, it used to be a fight with swords. One person kills another person. Now one person, he's sitting in Minnesota, or in one country, he's flying a drone that is bombing people in Yemen, and Iraq, and Syria, and Afghanistan. It kills hundreds of people. This technology, it's a good thing. But when it's used in a bad way, that means there's a problem. That means we still need someone to show us the way. And then, being religious, for the ones who say it's not relevant, go and look at the studies. Go and look at the institutions that do not, are not, they're secular institutions. They have done studies that show that following a religious system, following a religious belief system, is much better for your life than not following a religious system. And this is a study by the American Journal of Epidemiology. This is the study of epidemics. Study of when an epidemic kills people, they've, or people fall sick, they've done the study and they say that joining a religious group does more to someone's sustained happiness. This person, ultimately they will be more happy, they will be happier, sustained happiness, than other forms of social participation. So you join, a, you join a religious group or you go and join a yoga class. Which one will help you more to feel more happy? It is the religious group. And second, the study found religion led to the greatest mental benefits and it also lessened depression. Depression? How many people suffer from depression in this society? The solution is religion. The solution is following a system. Now someone might say, how? It doesn't, it's not something very difficult to comprehend because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in this way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us so that we worship, so that we follow that system. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ the body of the human and the spirit of the human, it's created so that it worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how we are programmed. This is why you see that when you are praying, you will feel satisfied. When you are worshipping, when you are reading munajat, you will feel at peace. And that peace, nothing else will bring it other than that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No money, no wealth, no fast car, no lifestyle other than being religious because Allah says, It is only through the remembrance of Allah, only through a connection with Allah that the hearts will find peace. And furthermore, for the ones that say, religion is not relevant, you see that if you make a mathematical calculation, if you use logic, you will see that religion is better off than not having religion. Why? This is letting alone that religious people are happier, they don't go through depression and all these other things that studies show. If ha having a religion increases the chances of success, and this has an argument that philosophers use, and this argument was used by Imam Sadiq with one of the Zanadqa, one of the atheists of his time. This man by the name of Ibn Abil Awja. This man came to the Imam and he was arguing. He was, a, he was an atheist. He was arguing the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the Imam. After arguing for hours and hours, the Imam told him, okay, let's say you win. Let's say there's no God. I go, I worship, I pray. It's not going to harm me. I'm going to live a religious lifestyle. And of course, when I follow the obligations that Allah has sent for me, this is something for me to live, a, this is a way for me to live a happier lifestyle. 
For example, Allah says, do not cheat, do not steal, do not abuse, do not backbite. Is this something wrong? Is there something wrong with that? Living with that lifestyle? Do not kill. This is the system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me. I'm, I'm going to live that style. And you're going to live your, sti your lifestyle of not worshipping. And you're going to do whatever you want. There's no moral system for you. You could do whatever you want. This is, let's say, if you were right. Now, let's say I was right. You know, you're not 100% sure that there's no God. There is a chance that there is a God. But then, I will have eternal paradise and eternal bliss while you will have eternal suffering. And if you compare this life with the eternal afterlife, which one is greater? So, if there is no God, you will only have this life. But if there is a God, I will have this life and I will have the afterlife. And this today, philosophers, they call this pa Pascal's wager. But of course, this argument was used by Imam Sadiq over a thousand years ago. So this is the first, the first reply to the first argument that religion is not relevant anymore. The second argument that is used by many atheists is that look at all the suffering that you see in the world today. All that suffering, all that bloodshed, all this evil in the world. How can you say there is a merciful Lord when there is so much suffering, when there is so much crime, when so many people are unhappy? How can you, how can you even say that there is a Lord when, this, when there is so much evil in the world? And we see that this is a legitimate argument. And we see that sometimes even some Muslims, even some believers... For example, someone, a lady, her son was killed. Her son had a disease and died or something happened. You see some religious people, some believers, they start questioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they start saying, why does this have to happen to me? I pray, I worship, I go to hajj. Why is this happening to me and no one else? We see that even sometimes some religious people ask this. In order... To fully comprehend this, we have to look at a few steps and a few answers. First, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to comprehend the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa rahmati wasi'at kulla shay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, my mercy has encompassed everything. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does no evil to anyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the source of mercy in our life. And He is the merciful. And the hadith says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His rahmah, there is 99% of His rahmah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has saved it to be used on the day of judgment. And 1% of that rahmah, Allah has allowed it to take place on earth. And from that 1%, you see the mother showing mercy towards her child. You see the mercy between one another, the love and the compassion and the humanity within people. Who placed that within them? Who programmed us to all view that oppression is wrong? If we were all created by chance, how, does, how do I know? And a million other people and six billion other people, we all agree that oppression is wrong. We all agree that cheating and fooling people and abusing people is something immoral and wrong. How do we all know that? We know that because this is how Allah programmed us. This is how Allah built us. This is how Allah created us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us all and He gave us that fitrah, that innate disposition. We all are created with that fitrah to know this is right, this is wrong, to know that good Doing good, acts of charity is something good. Every human being will tell you this. And even the ones who do not, they know that what they are doing is wrong, but they try to justify it in one way or another. The problem, it's not with Allah. The problem is when someone does not use that mercy that Allah equipped him with. The problem is when that mercy is taken out of someone's heart. So evil 
It's not a creation. Evil is the absence of good. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created mercy and good. But when someone does not use that good, when someone does not apply that mercy, then they will be doing evil. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create evil. Evil is the absence of good. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala programmed us, programmed us all to have that good. And we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is compassionate, even with the ones who do not even believe in Him. There's a story, a hadith, about the life of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. Prophet Ibrahim, he was a muwahid. He was a believer in God. And one of the acts that he was doing to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was that every day before he eats, he would go and stand outside his house and he would invite people to come and eat with him. He would invite people to come and eat with him. And the hadith says that this is one of the ways that Ibrahim became Khalilullah, the friend of Allah. It's by feeding other people. This is what Allah loves. Allah loves to see someone feed. Do good, show rahmah, show mercy to other people. So Ibrahim, every day he used to feed people. One day, a man came. And sometimes Ibrahim, because he was living in a time that sometimes he goes and stands on the road and no one comes. So he has to wait until someone passes by. One day, a man came, Ibrahim found him, he took him by his hand and he came to his house. He had the food ready in front of him. Ibrahim said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. That man, he did not say anything. So Ibrahim told him, you're not going to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? You're not going to acknowledge God? The man said, I don't believe in God. Ibrahim told him, how do you not believe in God? And he kept trying to prove to him that you have to believe in God. The man said, no, I don't want to believe in God. Ibrahim, at that moment, he told him, then you're not going to eat with me. You're not going to eat with me. The man said, you invited me to eat with you and now you're telling me not to eat? Okay, bye. And he left. After the man left, Jibra'il came down to Prophet Ibrahim salam, And he tells him, Oh Ibrahim, Allah says, I have been feeding this man his whole life and he does not acknowledge me. Now one time, you had the chance to feed this person and you refused to feed this person? I have been feeding him his whole life. Every breath, everything that he has is from Allah. And you refuse to feed him once? This is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah does not want injustice and oppression to anyone. Ya man yu'ti man sa'alah. Ya man yu'ti man lam yas'alhu wa man lam ya'rif. Allah is the one who gives the ones who do not ask Him and the ones who do not know Him. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another story, another hadith, Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. Prophet Nuh, he lived with his people for 950 years. Allah says in the Quran, he lived with his people for 950 years. He would call upon people to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would close their ears and they would cover their eyes so that they do not see Prophet Nuh inviting them towards Allah. The hadith says that after 300 years, after the first 300 years, Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, he raised his hand and he said, Oh Allah, bring your punishment upon these people. Now imagine, he was patient for 300 years and then he does a dua. Allah tells him, and this is a reminder for us because sometimes we're not patient for three minutes. Prophet Nuh was patient for 300 years. Allah tells him, oh no, be patient, be patient. There's a chance, maybe you could still guide these people. The second time he asked was another 300 years. So now he's with his people for 600 years. He's been telling them, believe in Allah, leave these idols, worship Allah. This is a better lifestyle for you. 
وقل تستغفروا ربكم إنه كان غفارا يرسل السماء عليكم مدرارا ويمددكم بأموال وبنين ويجعل لكم جنات ويجعل لكم أنهارا He's telling you Allah is going to give you paradise He's going to give you a blessing of a rain that will grow your crops, He will give you children, He will give you everything They continued to close their ears and ignore Him So now, 600 years He's been calling them Finally, Prophet Nuh, he raises his hands and he says, Oh Allah, bring your adab on these people. I have been calling them for 600 years. Here, the hadith says, Prophet, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Prophet Nuh, Oh Nuh, I want you to go and create and make clay pots. Go and make pots out of clay. So Prophet Nuh, without questioning why, this is the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he goes and he takes some mud and he makes clays and then he has to wait for them to dry. Of course, they didn't have the technology that they have right now. It's a hard process. He sits, he waits for them to dry. And then he tells Allah, oh Allah, I'm finished. After a few days or a few weeks, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, oh Nuh, go and destroy them. Nuh tells him, Oh Allah, you told me to make these, these pots, now you're telling me to destroy them? Here Allah told him, Oh Nuh, you want me to punish these people? I made them. I created them. I created them. You want me to just punish them because you're not happy with them? And then he waited another 300 years. Then after 900 years of being with his people, he did a dua, Allah accepted his dua. And then it took him 50 years to build the ark. 950 years he was with his people. This is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah doesn't punish people just very quickly. Allah doesn't punish people just because they're not believing in him. Because you see many people do not believe in God and they're very well, they're very healthy, there's nothing wrong with them. When does Allah punish? When does the adab come? The adab comes in the eyes of Allah. There are some things that are more severe than other things. One of the things that is severe is when you oppress another group of people. Allah says in the Quran, Allah says, وَتِلْكَ الْقُرَىٰ أَهْلَكْنَاهَا لَمَّا ظَلَمُوا these villages, Allah speaks about the people of Prophet Lut, Qom Ad, Qom Thamud. Allah says these villages, we brought down the wrath of Allah upon them. Lamma ظلموا Once they became oppressors, once it led to oppression, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not allow oppression with, to go without justice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes you see He waits. The hadith says, Allah waits, but He does not let go and He does not forget. So punishment sometimes comes upon a group of people. Adab comes upon a group of people. But it's because they have oppressed themselves. It's once they have abused themselves. The facade, the problems, and the evil emerged on earth when bima kasabat aidil nas it's what people have done to themselves and this is the human nature today why is there poverty didn't allah allow food to grow for everyone why is there shortage of water didn't allah bring water for everyone why are there people being killed didn't allah give everyone life didn't allah give everyone the breath didn't allah give us and show us mercy at a time where no one was there for us. There was a time that no one knew about me when I was in the womb of my mother. Who was sending that nourishment to me? Who was providing for me at that time? Wasn't it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah gives, but you see the human being is so arrogant. It's such a criminal that with one push of a button, they will exterminate thousands of people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created this human to live. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّنَّا بَنِي آدَمٍ But it's the actions of people that bring death and that bring crime and that bring oppression to other people. 
But of course, we the humans, we only want to take credit. And then if something bad happens, right away, Allah did this, it's not us. We just know how to blame other people. But we only want to take credit when something good happens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes a group of people when they have allowed oppression within themselves and within their society. Now someone might come and say, where's the mercy of Allah? Why does Allah not allow oppression to take place? Why does Allah allow a zalim to oppress other people? Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a system. Allah has a system and He created us with that system. First of all, Allah gave us all the intellect. Allah gave us the ability to choose in life. Imma shakiran wa imma kafura. And then if Allah is going to intervene every time there's oppression, then how is He going to be able to distinguish from the good and the bad? How is He going to reward someone? If Allah didn't allow, for example, someone to oppress another people, Qabil to oppress Habil, how are we going to know? How is Allah going to distinguish and judge between the people? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets, He sent messengers, He gave us the logic and the fitrah, He programmed within us for us to know what's wrong and what's right. But then Allah is not going to come and interfere every time there's oppression. Because otherwise, where is then, then Allah will be forcing us. We will be ro robots. We will be robots. Do this, do that, do this, do that. Where's the test? Where's the karama of the human being? One of the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored us is by giving us the ability to choose and make decisions in life. Another, another reason why there is suffering sometimes is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us. Sometimes Allah is not bringing down the adab upon a group of people, but He is only testing that group of people. And Allah mentions in numerous verses in the Quran, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَنْ يُتْرَكُوا أَنْ يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ do people think that they will be left alone? They just say, I believe in Allah. And they will not be tested? The day of Ashura, we were gathered to remember Imam al Hussein. The day of Ashura, there were two prayers. There was one prayer in the camp of Imam al Hussein, and there was another prayer in the other camp. So, anyone can say, I believe. Anyone can say, I'm believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But, Sometimes you have to make decisions in life. Sometimes we have to make difficult decisions in life. And this is the fitna. This is the test that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us with. In another verse, Allah says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةِ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا If Allah doesn't test us, how are we going to know who is the good person, who is a role model? who's not a role model, everyone will be the same. What's the point? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the ghafoor, He is the Rahim, but Allah is also the adil. Allah is also just. And this is something that we have to believe in. There's a justice system. And Allah is the judge. And third, sometimes I may look at something as suffering, but in fact, it's not suffering. I may look at something, Allah is testing me, this is a form of suffering for me. But in reality, in the eyes of Allah, this is not suffering. In the eyes of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to raise you. Allah wants you to be at a higher level. When you are taking your tests in your university or in your school, do you consider that suffering? No. This is an opportunity for you to grow. This is an opportunity for you to get a degree, a higher degree, and become a better person. Some people, they sign up for a test, and they're happy when they're allowed to take the test. Same with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes when Allah tests us, this is a sign that Allah loves us. This means that Allah wants us to grow. Allah wants me to become a better person. Allah does not want to just reward me the simple reward. 
Allah wants me to be to have a higher level in paradise. And this is why we see that the Anbiya, the Prophets of Allah, they were the ones that were tested the most difficult tests. Go and look at the lives of the Prophets. Allah mentions them in the Quran. Prophet Yusuf, he was tested. He was separated from his father for 40 years. Prophet Yaqub was tested. Prophet Zakaria, he was cut up by the, by the saw, by his people, Bani Israel. They cut him up. Prophet Yahya was beheaded. Prophet Musa was tested. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, ma uthiya nabiyun mithla ma uthiyit. No prophet has been harassed and abused the way that I have been abused. So when uh, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us. And that test, it's not a form of suffering, but it's a form where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to have a higher level in paradise. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says in a hadith, إِنَّ الْبَلَاءِ لِلظَّالِمْ adab." The bala, the suffering for the oppressor, it's a form of discipline. And then he says, وَلِلْمُؤْمِنْ imtihan." But for the believer, it's a test. وَلِلْأَنْبِيَاءِ darajah, And for the prophets, it's so Allah elevates them and raises them. وَلِلْأَوْلِيَاءِ karama. And for the awliya, the believers and the mu'mineen, it's a form of blessing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is blessing them. This is why... When we go and we look at the Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam, when we look at the Imams, we see that every time the test was getting more difficult and more difficult, they were feeling more, more spirituality. They were getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al Hussein on the day of Ashura, he was feeling that he had an opportunity to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the suffering became more severe, he was glowing and he was feeling that he is reaching Allah and being able to offer something to Allah that no one else can offer. Every time one of his children, one of his companions would be killed, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he would say, Hawwana, hawwana ma bi annahu Allah. What has made this musibah, what has made this suffering easy for me is that Allah is the judge, Allah is watching. And when Allah is watching, Allah will reward you. So do not give up hope. Do not give up hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or in the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ultimately, justice will prevail. As long as you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we look at the Ahl al-Bayt, when we even look at the children of Imam al Hussein, don't you, you don't need to go and look at the adults. Look at the five year old daughter of Imam al Hussein. Look at the young children of Imam al Hussein. Go and read the narrations of the maqatil. Go and read the events that took place on Karbala. Not one time will you see one child of Imam al Hussein say, Why is this happening to us? Why does this have to happen to us and not anyone else? These little children. This is the family of Rasulullah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to raise them. So he tests them. So he brings them closer to him through the testing. Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam on the day of Ashura, she goes to the body of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. That body that it was so disfigured that even Sukaina, the daughter of Imam al Hussein, she could not tell who Zainab was speaking to. She couldn't tell. There's no head, there's no clothes. It's filled with wounds. Sayyida Zainab, alayhi salam, she goes to the body and she says one word that remains throughout time and it never dies throughout time. She goes. She places her hands under the body of Aba Abdullah and she raises that body and she says, Allahumma taqabbal minna qurban Ali Muhammad. Oh Allah, accept from us the sacrifice of Al Muhammad. This is the patience. This is the Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam. 
They take Sayyidah Zainab and the woman and the children to the palace of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Over there, he has the head of Imam al Hussein in front of him. And he is hitting the head of Imam al Hussein. He tells her, كَيْفَ رَأَيْتِ صُنْعَ اللَّهِ بِأَخِيكِ وَأَهْلِ بَيْتِكِ How do you see what Allah has done to your brother? Allah did this to your brother. He tells Zainab, Allah did this to your brother. What does Zainab answer at that time where they are, all the men in the family have been killed. There's no one with them other than Zain al-Abideen. What does Zainab answer? She says, Ma ra'aytu illa jameela. All I saw was beauty. Ma ra'aytu illa jameela. هَؤُلَاءِ قَوْمٌ كَتَبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُمُ الْقَتْلِ فَبَرَزُوا إِلَى مَضَاجِعِهِمْ وَسَيَجْمَعُ اللَّهُ بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُمْ فَتُحَاجْ وَتُخَاصَمْ فَانْظُرْ لِمَنِ الْفَلَجْ يَوْمَ إِذٍ ثَكَلَتْكَ أُمُّكَ يَا بْنَ مَرْجَانَ إمام الحسين عليه السلام the family of Imam al-Hussein, they were tested in the most difficult test. Does this mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was angry with them? Does this mean that Allah wants to oppress them? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to raise them. And because of their actions on that day, because they passed that test. You know Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah tested him that difficult test by ordering him to slaughter his son. Ismail. And then Allah says, وَإِنَّ هَذَا لَهُوَ الْبَلَاءُ الْعَظِيمُ This is the greatest test. And then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Ibrahim the maqam al-imamah. He gave him the position of imamah. Now you go and you look at the bala of Imam al-Husayn, who actually, he actually sacrificed his sons, one after the other. Isn't this bala a'zam? Isn't this sacrifice much more difficult than that of Ibrahim alayhi salam? Now imagine the position that Imam al Hussein has. My dear brothers and sisters, my time is almost up. And on a night like this we remember Umm al banin that wife of Amir al muminin After the martyrdom of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, Amir al muminin he married Umm al banin And there's a story, we will mention that on the day we remember Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. However, that lady, that honorable lady, Umm al banin she raised, she took on the responsibility of raising the children of Amir al muminin And she raised them not as stepchildren, but she raised them as the Imams. She raised them showing them love. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave her also four children. He gave her four children, but she would always favor the children of Fatima over her own children. Because these children, Hassan and Hussein, Zainab and Umm Kulthum, they are connected to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So Umm al banin would favor them. But you know that lady, Umm al banin on one day she lost her own children and the one who she saw greater than her own children, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. When the caravan of Bani Hashim came back to Medina, they came back without the man, without Imam al Hussein, without Abu al Fadl al Abbas. Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam, he asked Bishr ibn Hadlam to enter Medina and mourn Aba Abdullah. Bishr ibn Hadlam, he entered Medina and he began to cry, Ya Ahla Yathrib, la muqam lakum biha. O oh, people of Medina, Medina is not a city to live in anymore. They told him, Mal khabar, what has happened? He tells them, Al khabar, and the qabr Rasulullah. I will give you the news next to the grave of Rasulullah. They go over there and he tells them what has happened. Then he says, I saw a tall lady. She came, she was carrying a child. 
she came, she seemed to be confused. She says, oh Na'i, oh man who is crying and mourning, tell me what has happened. Tell me about my son Hussein. He says, I asked, who is this lady? They told me, this is Umm al banin the mother of Abbas and the brothers of Abbas. So he said, I told her, Ya Umm al banin Adham Allah lak al bi waladiki Ja'far. O oh, Umm al banin may Allah give you patience for the loss of your son Ja'far. She says, do not tell me about Ja'far, tell me about my son Hussein. He tells her, O oh, Umm al banin Adham Allah lak al bi waladiki Abdullah. She says, tell me about Hussein until he tells her, O oh, Umm al banin Adham Allah lak al bi Abi al-Fadl al-Abbas. She says, that he says, the child fell from her shoulder and she said, tell me about my son Hussein, you have broken my heart. He tells her, Ya Umm al banin Adham Allah lak al on the plains of Karbala and his head was raised on a spear. He says, Umm al banin she went to give her condolences to Sayyida Zainab alayhi salam. She has to go and see Zainab. Zainab is like her daughter. She goes, she knocks on the door. They say Umm al banin is in the door. Sayyida Zainab, she goes and she welcomes her. Sayyida Zainab says, Wa Abbasa. Umm al banin she says, Wa Walada, Wa Husayna. And then Umm al banin she looks at Zainab. She says, she says, is that you, Zainab? Zainab was unrecognizable after only four months, a few months of traveling because of what has happened to them. She tells her auntie Zainab al Hashimiya, you are Zainab from the children of Hashim. Zainab replies, Ana Zainab al Masbiya. I am Zainab, the one that was taken as a captive, as a prisoner in the Muslim land. Umm al Banin alayhi salam. She would go to the Baqi and she would stand and she says, La tadhuwanni wayki umm al banin tudakkirini bil yuth al ari kanat banun li adabim wal yawm asbahat wala min banin layta shi'ri ha kama akhbaru bi anna لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون أسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم العبد الأجل الأكرم يا الله يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات تابع اللهم بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك غافر الخطيئات إنك ماحي السيئات إنك على كل شيء قدير وصلى الله على محمد وآل محمد